So, good evening, dear viewers. Welcome to the latest BH Futures webinar. Tonight's topic is one that is personally very close to my heart and one I believe many of us need to hear. Uh, the title our speaker picked out is quite fitting considering the trends of hustle culture that many of us do engage in. So, this honorable speaker, speaker Alan Yoginovich, is both a medical doctor and a postdoctoral researcher in the Department of Neurobiology at Harvard Medical School. Uh, his work is aimed at studying the effects of sleep deprivation on health and the gut-brain axis. It is quite a task to summarize his remarkable biography, but some of the key milestones in his life include his medical education in Split, Croatia, which he completed back in 2018, followed by work in the Center for Sleep Medicine at the University Hospital. During his studies, he founded the Society for Neuroscience, Naoto Split, and was heavily involved in various national and international projects, and organizing numerous events in the areas of science and education. He has a strong desire to give back to the community, and he and his team organized many charity concerts with famous Croatian singers, with uh, cumulatively about thousands of participants who kindly donated money to help children and other people in need. He attended and spoke at many national and international conferences, published scientific papers, and was a member of the various organization committees, including the 2019 ISABS conference, which gathered four Nobel laureates, I hope I pronounced this correctly. Uh, he did two observership programs in the US. So I'm going to skip a bit of his biography since it's quite extensive and uh, skip on to what he's currently doing alongside his work, which is he is the head of Medinex, a non-government organization dedicated to organizing international conferences and helping creation students gain valuable international experience. Alana, thank you so much for being here and please tell us why sleep is not for the week. Thank you, Anna. I hope everybody can hear me. Uh... It's a great pleasure uh, to be here, even though it's quite gloomy and rainy in Boston. I hope this, this um, seminar webinar is going to be more uh, uh, better than the weather um, here. So yeah, I'm gonna, just going to share my, my screen. And we're going to go through this presentation. Uh, just a second. Yeah. So, so basically, um, thanks enough for the for the introduction. Uh, my name is Alan, and I, as and I said, I'm a postdoctoral researcher here at the Department of Neurobiology here at Harvard Medical School in Boston, in the U.S. And today, I'm going to talk to you about sleep, why sleep is important, and why sleep is not for the weak, as many people say. You know, many people skip, unfortunately, sleep due to you know work and other obligations, and you know, cut on sleep, which is not great, especially in the long term and hopefully I will convince you not to cut on sleep the next time you you think about it. So I'm just going to start real quick um, um, with today's plan. So I'm just going to tell you very briefly, I can maybe skip all together um, uh, my story, how I, how I came here to Harvard Medical School. Then we can talk, we are going to talk about what is sleep, about the circadian rhythm, why is sleep actually important and why do we need sleep? I'm going to tell you a few fun sleep stories, and then I'm going to tell you about my research on sleep deprivation here at, at the medical school. You can ask questions during, you know, any time you want, just raise your hand or, or and, uh, whatever you like. Um, I'm open to, you know, any questions at the end or during the, the seminar, feel free to, feel free to interrupt. So yeah, um, my story, I'm just going to very briefly go through what I said. I was born in sleep Croatia and finished my medical degree there, and I did very, very many um, extracurricular activities with a great team of people at the University of Split School of Medicine. Among others, I'm just going to name, uh, name a couple. Uh, we organized um, international conferences and Nobel laureate conferences, which, which all together basically brought more than 2,000 students to Split Croatia in three years and six Nobel laureates from basically 34 nationalities. I think the students were of 34 nationalities. And you know, it was great pleasure working with, with these people here on, on so many, so many projects. And then during my medical studies, I got into neuroscience, um, started getting interested into neuroscience brain and specifically sleep around my second or third year of study out of six years of study um, um, at the medical school in Split. And then because, because of that, I volunteered um, in the sleep laboratory. You can see one of the beds in our sleep laboratory in, in Split, Croatia, where we diagnose health patients and diagnose patients with 
with sleep disorders. And because of that, I, I, I basically pursued a neuroscience um, career along with, with um, clinical medical career. And all of a sudden, in a very interesting story, um, uh, which we can talk about at the end, not really very important. Now I got to Harvard Medical School in February of 2020. So I'm, I'm here for a year and like seven, eight, eight months. And I work primarily with mice, as you can see, uh, my cute friends here. I work with them. Previously, I worked with, with fruit flies, but now I primarily work with mice and researching the effect of sleep deprivation on health. And now we can start um, with the basic basics about sleep. What is actually sleep? I, I, think, I think this definition is, is very, very common. It, it says it's a state of altered consciousness and it's characterized by a relative inhibition of both sensory activity and almost all voluntary muscles. And importantly, it's characterized by reduced interaction with the environment. When people ask me, you know, what's the ideal amount of time that I need to sleep? The doctors would say ideally between seven to nine hours per day. And I just want to pause here very quickly. It's important to have those seven to nine hours in continuity, meaning not sleep for four hours during the night and then an additional five hours during the day. Because in, in, in sleep, four plus five is equal nine, but it's not the same as nine hours in continuity during, during the night. That's very, very important to note. Some people also ask me, is, is it healthy to, you know, to take a nap um, during the day? And the answer is yes, but with, with a small asterisk there. Why? Because naps during the day should ideally last up to 30, 40 minutes. Why? Because we don't want um, to sleep for longer because we would go into deeper stages of sleep. And if you were to go into deeper stages of sleep during the day, for continuous multiple days in a row, that has the potential to disrupt your night sleep and basically your circadian rhythm, which we will get to a bit, a bit later. <clears throat> also, one misconception about sleep is that sleep is a very passive state. You know, you go to bed, you lie, and then you, you know, you move a bit in bed, but nothing much. But on the contrary, actually, sleep is a very, very active state. You're you're some parts of your brain are even more active during sleep than when awake. And we found that out not only in human studies, but in studies on, on, on smaller mammals such as mice and rats. So here I have three images of a mouse or a rat brain, doesn't matter. While the rat or mouse is awake, so this is in French and I, I, I'm terrible at pronouncing this. So <laughs> the left one, is the mouse when, mouse's brain when, when, when it's awake. The middle picture image is when the mouse is in light sleep. And the right image is when the mouse is in REM sleep, or sometimes it's called paradoxical sleep. I'm gonna explain why. What I want you to note here is that the, the, the redder, the more, yellow, orange, and more red the, the color is, that means there's more blood flow coming to those brain regions. And that means those brain regions, i.e. those neurons, need more oxygen or nutrients or whatever, meaning they're more active. So the more the red, the more neurons are active. As you can see in during awake, some parts of red, some parts of the brain are red and yellow, but you can see most of the other parts are kind of bluish, greenish, meaning not meaning active, but not as active as the, as the red parts. During light sleep, you can see that the brain activity is overall lower than during, than during awake. But when you go to REM sleep, one of the stages of, of sleep, you can see all sorts of brain regions very, very active and much more active than, than when awake. And it's called paradoxical sleep because many parts of the brain are active while you're asleep, which is kind of paradoxical. At least it was paradoxical years and years ago, but now it's not that, that paradoxical. So stages of sleep. I would just like to, 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 to tell you more about what sleep consists of. So when you go to bed, what happens to, to, to your brain and the overall 
body as it goes through the stages of sleep. So when you go to bed in normal adults, you go, you go to bed, you feel you know, sleepy, drowsy and whatever. And then you go into stage one. It is the shortest stage of sleep and the lightest phase of sleep. And it's also called light sleep. It's called light sleep because you're easily woken up by environmental stimuli, someone calling you, someone just lightly touching you or whatever else, um, whatever else environmental stimuli that's very, very mild. Also, there's this phenomena called hypnic jerk in, within stage one of sleep. I think most of you experience it. What is it? It's actually um, um, the sensation of falling. When you go to sleep, you have this, this sensation of falling and then you kind of, you know, twitch and, and your muscles kind of kind of twitch and, and you wake up and, oh, I'm actually here, not falling from a cliff or whatever. And that phenomena is called hypnic jerk. After stage one, which is very, very short, you go to stage two. Yeah, I wouldn't call stage two deep sleep. It's kind of middle ground between light and deep sleep, but definitely deeper than stage one. It's also the longest stage of sleep, and you can easily recognize it with some specific EEG features. EEG is also called, it, it's it basically an abbreviation for electroencephalography, electro meaning some electrical activity, and cephalo meaning the brain, and G, graphy, graphene like to write. So basically you are writing the electrical activity of the brain. You can see an example of EEG recordings here. And this is very, very specific. These two features, one is called sleep spindle. The other is called K-complex. They're very specific for stage two of sleep. And here on the left, you can see a patient in a sleep laboratory connected to EEG electrodes. So the EEG electrodes go on the skull so you can record the surface, that's very important, the surface activity of the brain. So you can't really record the activity, you know, deep within the brain, within the deep, deep structures within the brain, but only surface activity. But that's enough to determine if the patient is in stage one, stage two, or other stages of sleep. After stage two, you go into deep sleep, which is called also stage three, or stage four of sleep. Why? Because the American Academy of Sleep Medicine and the European Academy of Sleep Medicine differentiate some, one differentiates between stage three and stage four, whereas the other says there's only stage three. But that's not very important here. The important part is deep sleep, stage three or four of sleep is very important for you feeling relaxed and rested the next day. It's also very, very important for memory consolidation. So that's why I tell many people, you know, before an exam, try to sleep at least a bit because it's not great if you don't sleep the whole night, then, you know, go do an exam, you won't be concentrated and all the other, other things. Also, during deep, deep sleep stages, some people go through what, what are called parasomnias. Parasomnias are very interesting um, activities that people unconsciously and unwillingly do during sleep. For example, sleep talking, for example, sleep walking, for example, grinding, grinding their teeth, for example. Also, there's, a, there's an interesting one where people pretend they're fighting somebody during sleep. So you can see on, on video recordings, when you, when you record people, they're unconsciously doing all of this. They basically get out of bed and try fighting some imaginary, you know, um, enemy or something like that. That's called, that's also called a parasomnia. And you have loads of these parasomnias, which, which, you know, can range from, you know, relatively bizarre to extremely bizarre. Also during deep sleep, if somebody wakes you up, wakes you up from deep sleep, and you've all experienced this, sometimes when, when somebody wakes you up, you feel very tired, confused, not knowing what's going on. It, and it takes, you know, minutes and minutes and maybe an hour for you to, you know, um, 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 figure out what's going on. That's because somebody woke you up from deep sleep and not from light sleep or REM. And that phenomena is called sleep inertia, meaning it takes, takes a while for you to realize what's going on. And after stage three, four, four, 
you go to REM sleep, which is called paradoxical sleep, we've seen on the images um, uh, on the prior slide uh, that the brain is very active during REM sleep. And most of the dreams occur during REM sleep, but not all dreams occur. So if somebody asks you, are dreams you know, only in REM? The answer is no. Dreams can occur in any stage, but are primarily associated with REM. Also, REM is very specific because one part of your nervous system called the sympathetic nervous system gets activated, meaning your heart, your heart starts beating um, um, quickly, your blood pressure raises, and it's as though you're in some kind of you know, stressful situation. It's not stress, but, it, but it, the body reacts as if you're in some stressful situation. And the sympathetic part of nervous system obviously gets um, uh, activated during stressful situations when you are awake. This method that I, that I um, um, show you, EEG, where we measure uh, brain activity, is, is only one of many, many um, diagnostic tools that we use in the sleep clinic. So apart from the EEG, as you can see here, we also use other tools such as EMG, electromyography, meaning that we measure muscle tone here, for example, on the chin. We also use EOG, electrooculography, to see the, the activity of the, of the eyes. Also, we use these two belts here. The upper one is called the thoracic belt or the upper belt. The lower one is called the abdominal belt or lower belt. We use them to see if the patient's chest and or abdomen are moving, meaning if he's breathing or not. But we also use a nasal cannula to see the airflow um, um, that's going in the nose or, or in the mouth. And all of that combined, that diagnostic method combined is called polysomnography. So polysomnography is very, very, very regularly used in sleep laboratories to determine all sorts of sleep disorders from insomnia, sleep apnea, all sorts of parasomnias, and just in general, the sleep architecture. Meaning if the person actually goes from stage one, then two, then three, then REM, and then back usually to stage two, three, REM, two, three, REM. So that's called a normal sleep cycle. And one sleep cycle from stage one or two to REM usually lasts 100 minutes. And many people, because of all sorts of reasons, have a disruption in their sleep architecture, meaning when they go asleep, they immediately go to REM or stage three. And the lack of stage two or stage one of sleep can also be associated with various cognitive deficits during the day or you know, um, um, in the next uh, months. So it's very important not only to go through the stages in the, in the correct order, but also the percentage of each state in sleep is also very, very important. And here, this is a very, very um, classical image of a polysomnographic recording. You can see all sorts of waves and, you know, to, to a person who's not familiar with the topic, it may seem like, what the hell is going on here? But it's, it's rather simple once you get used to it. So in the, I'm just gonna go briefly through it uh, to show you. So in the first four rows, you can see recordings from the electrodes, from the EEG electroencephalography, electrodes meaning the activity of the brain. And these waves here, once you get the, um, um, you know, the experience, you can very easily recognize them as something that looks like REM sleep. You can confirm REM sleep by looking at the, at the movement of the eyes because REM stands for rapid eye movement, meaning the eyes move rapidly during that sleep phase. And here you can see no eye movement and then one movement and then another, another, another. And that combined with the EEG and some other parameters, you can very easily determine the person is in REM sleep. You can also see heart rate, and one very important um, note where it says chin, that's the chin EMG electromyography, you can see it's almost, it is basically a flat line, meaning during REM sleep, the muscle tone is extremely low or, or there is no tone, which is called muscle atonia. 
So that is very characteristic of REM. As you go deeper into sleep, your muscles relax more and more and reach the lowest point during REM sleep, even though your eyes move very rapidly, which is a bit paradoxical. But, but yeah, this is, this is a recording of, this is an image of REM sleep. But, but how does actually sleep even start? You know, we all go to bed and lay down for like 10, 15, maybe 20, 30 minutes. And then all of a sudden, whoop, we go to sleep and wake up and you don't kind of remember anything before unless you've dreamed, and unless you, you remember the dreams you had the night. But it, it's, some, it's somewhat mysterious. And, and, and the, the easiest and simplest way I can, I can tell you how sleep starts, it's basically a, a very, very interesting chemistry of various neurotransmitters, such as dopamine, noradrenaline, serotonin, adenosine, acetylcholine, and others. So very, a very delicate and interesting chemistry, but in a very, very easy and simple language. The mo one of the most important molecules is adenosine. And adenosine is produced when ATP, adenosine triphosphate, is degraded. So when you need energy, when your cells need energy for walking, for thinking, for any sort of um, uh, activity, cognitive or, or physical activity, ATP molecules, which are called energy molecules, get degraded to ADP, adenosine diphosphate, meaning one phosphate is taken out, or adenosine monophosphate, meaning two phosphates from the original triphosphate are taken out. And the important part is in that degradation, adenosine is also released. And then adenosine, as, as, you know, as you do various activities during the day, more and more adenosine is produced, whether you're just you know, at home cooking, thinking, talking, or actually doing some physical activity, more and more adenosine is produced. And at one point, and that's usually the evening, adenosine, there's a, a substantial amount of adenosine and it binds to its A1 receptors. We're, we're, all, we're talking all within the brain here. It binds to its A1 receptors and by binding to those receptors, and this is important, it inhibits a wake-promoting neurotransmitter, which is called acetylcholine. So acetylcholine is very important for keeping you awake. And when you have more adenosine, meaning you, you, you've done a lot of physical or mental activity, it inhibits that acetylcholine and then the, the balance shifts in favor of adenosine, meaning towards sleep, sleepiness, sleep. But some might say, wait, Alan, acetylcholine is not only important for, for being awake, it's also important in REM. Absolutely true. REM is very, very famous for having the loads of acetylcholine release during REM sleep. And that's also one of the reasons why REM is called paradoxical sleep, because we're used to acetylcholine being, you know, at high levels when awake. But here, I would like you to remember that acetylcholine equals wake promoting neurotransmitter, but also present in, in REM. And this adenosine doesn't only inhibit uh, acetylcholine release, it also inhibits very important neurons in the hypothalamus, which is a brain region I'm gonna show you on the next slide. And those neurons are, are called hypocretin or orexin. So that's the same, the same uh, population of neurons. They're very important for keeping you awake too. So you can see the, the kind of the cascade, but this is all happening in parallel. It's not like step one, step two, step three, all happening in parallel. And by inhibiting all these weight promoting neurons, orexin or acetylcholine, it, um, adenosine makes you feel sleepier and sleepier. And also one very important thing that adenosine acts on is it excites a certain part of the hypothalamus, a certain um, a nucleus, which is called the ventral lateral preoptic nucleus, very complicated name, but one nucleus um, um, in the brain to secrete GABA, which is a very important inhibitory neurotransmitter. And that inhibitory neurotransmitter inhibits um, um, a part of the brainstem, which I'm going to show you here, this part of the brainstem, which is the, the, a, a, a very complicated network and net of neurons important 
in controlling the sleep-wake regulation. And by inhibiting that part, there's the, the signals going to other parts of the brain are reduced. And that's why your brain is very, very figuratively saying shutting down, but it's not actually shutting down, but very figuratively saying shutting down and pre being prepared for sleep. So this is a very, very simple overview that, that, that I gave you. It's much more complicated. And the, the, the delicate balance of all those neurotransmitters is extremely important. And if you disrupt any of those neurotransmitters, for example, by using any drugs or something like that, your sleep can very, very easily um, um, be disrupted. For example, people who take um, drugs that, that influence um, uh, levels of serotonin or dopamine, for example, people with, with depressive disorders, often have trouble sleeping because the balance is not there. The delicate balance of neurotransmitters is not there. Here on this, on this slide, you can see the brain basically um, um, cut in half. And I, I would just like to point you uh, a few important regions for sleep that we talked about earlier. The basal forebrain, this part of the brain, is very important in, in acet acetylcholine secretion. So when adenosine, um, after you, you, you did your, all your mental and physical work, adenosine is secreted. The important thing is that uh, the, the adenosine here inhibits the, the acetylcholine um, uh, release, meaning it prepares you for sleep. Furthermore, one very important region of the brain that we're going to talk about during this whole presentation is this green kind of part here. It's called the hypothalamus. And why is it important? Because it houses a nucleus, which is called the suprahiasmatic nucleus. Suprahiasmatic meaning above the, the, the optic hiasm, the, the hiasm where the two optic nerves kind of meet each other. It's very important because the SCN, the suprahiasmatic nucleus, houses the master, meaning principal, primary circadian clock. And the circadian clock is the one that controls your sleep and wake cycle, meaning that in, during the night, it tells, tells you you need to sleep. And in the morning, it tells you you need to wake up and be awake during basically the whole day. So that's extremely important in that region for, for sleep. There are also other regions um, uh, such as the pons, one region of the brainstem that's extremely important in initiating REM sleep. And also other regions. One of the more probably famous ones because of the melatonin secretion is the pineal gland, which is located here. And I think most of you have heard of, of melatonin which is important in sleep onset. So melatonin also makes you feel sleep. We're gonna talk about melatonin just a bit, a bit later. Now we're gonna go um, um, to, to, to talk about circadian rhythm. So circadian rhythm, as I said, is an endogenous um, um, cyclic rhythm that lasts around 24 hours. Actually, it was found that it lasts a bit more than 24 hours. I think like 24 hours and 10, 15 minutes, something like that. That is the main driver of the sleep-wake cycle. That tells you you need to sleep, you need to be awake. And that, that very, very important um, um, uh, rhythm was actually discovered using a very simple organ. I mean, it, it's relatively simple organism, a plant. So... I think like 200 years ago or more, maybe 250 years ago, there was this person that, that observed a plant, I don't know the exact name of the plant, but a plant that during the night, it closes its leaves. And during the day, it opens its leaves. And it fascinated him <laughs> that, that, that those plants can kind of sense if it's day or night. And then he did this very simple experiment. <coughs> Excuse me. He did this very simple experiment. He took that plant and put it in a container and closed it. So the plant couldn't see if it's day or night. And then he thought, okay, if the plant can see if it's day or night, maybe it won't close its leaves or open its leaves. But 
to basically um, um, his surprise, the plant actually opened and closed its leaves, even though it didn't see or sense light, which, which led him to believe that the plant had some internal rhythm that controlled uh, the opening, closing of the leaves, and not only uh, uh, the light coming from, you know, from the windows and so on. And then later on, in the in the in the um, fruit fly, so you know, like a half a, a centimeter, basically a, a centimeter max, two centimeters big animal. The uh, um, um, U.S. scientists discovered the basic fun functioning and the basic molecules, which are displayed here, which we can talk about later, that control the circadian rhythm. And they won the Nobel Prize in 2017, so like four 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 years ago. And and the main um, uh, driver of the circadian rhythm, as I said, is located in the hypothalamus, in the suprahiasmatic nucleus. And that's important because when that um, rhythm tells you, when that, when that nucleus tells you to go to sleep, it, pre it basically sends signals to the whole body to prepare and, 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 and you know, perform processes that it needs to do during sleep, such as cell such as cell and tissue regeneration, and also millions of other bio, biochemical processes that are not specifically going on during wake, but only or mostly, better said, during sleep. And it does that by, by secreting hormones and through neuronal signaling to all sorts of tissues, organs, and cells. Because each, almost every cell in the body has its own internal circadian clock, which is called a peripheral clock. So a liver has its peripheral clock, the lungs, the intestines, the heart, well, they all have their own peripheral clocks. And the important role of the SCN, of the, of the master clock, the superhismatic nucleus, is to synchronize all those clocks so they don't go away, you know, they, they don't um, um, freak out, oh my God, if it, is it night, is it day, whatever. So that's extremely important. And I, I hope you can kind of appreciate that when you go to sleep way too late or way too early, you can easily, in a short period of time, disrupt the central clock, the suprahasmatic nucleus, and thus all the peripheral, peripheral clocks. So that's one of the reasons how, why sleep is extremely important. And the most important cue for the, for the uh, suprahasmatic nucleus to know if it's day or night is obviously sun light. I wouldn't say sunlight, I would say light because it can be light from, you know, um, from internal lights in, in your home or unfortunately the, the light from the, from the laptop screen or um, a smartphone screen or anything like that. So you can see here how easily you can also disrupt the suprahasmatic nucleus by using your, you know, um, 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 electronic devices late at night, and uh, your poor SCN thinks it's actually light, but it, it, it's actually day, but it should be should be night. So, so yeah, one advice is right before bed, don't use your your um, electronic um, devices. This is also a very very um, um, simple schematic of of how primarily melatonin, an important, important um, uh, neurotransmitter, is secreted and how it promotes sleep. So I'm not going to go through all of this, but the, the important part is when light at, from, from the sun, from the computer screen or whatever light activates specific cells, oops, specific cells in the retina of the eye, that starts a cascade that tells the suprahasmatic nucleus, the green thing here, to start, to, uh, uh, start uh, all the processes associated with day, with, with daytime, because there's light outside. And thus, because it's day outside, it does not want melatonin, a sleep promoter, to be secreted. But let's pretend there's no light outside. If there's no light outside, the SCN thinks, okay, it's very likely night, it's most certainly night, we need to secrete melatonin. And one interesting thing here is, is that structures outside of the brain are involved in secreting melatonin, meaning this is a, 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 a section of the, of the um, 
of the um, 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 central nervous system, but but the but not the um, but not the brain. And you can see here the spinal cord, and you can see here that certain neurons within the spinal cord are actually involved through other structures such as the superior cervical ganglion in promoting melatonin secretion from the pineal gland, which is very interesting. I, I don't think many people know that actually structures outside of the brain are also important for promoting, for promoting sleep. And people who have um, um, severe um, um, damages of the spinal cord at certain levels can also have a disrupted melatonin secretion and thus disrupted sleep, which is also very interesting. But most, most of those people, people um, 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 have disrupted um, melatonin secretion because of car accidents or other types of accidents where the spinal cord is severed at a certain um, uh, level, unfortunately. After um, um, uh, we've seen the relative basics of sleep and the circadian rhythm, I would like to present you the data on why sleep is like, you know, real data on why sleep is very important for your body. So of course we know that sleep is incredibly important for memory, for, you know, for, for just remembering facts, but sleep is also important for immunological memory meaning your immune system is, that can be easily disrupted by sleep. One study showed that, that people um, um, who, who sleep poorly have a multiple fold increase in getting literally the common cold. Why? Because the immunological system can be disrupted, its function. It, it can be abolished completely, but can be disrupted that you're more susceptible to certain, certain infections. Furthermore, we all know that if you sleep poorly, your concentration is lower and your mood is, 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 is a bit off. Um, and, and there was a study that showed that many disasters, in, including the Chernobyl one, were partly, obviously not solely and 100%, but were partly um, caused by people who slept poorly or who had very, very um, odd um, circadian uh, rhythms because of their shifts. Um, uh, and they couldn't concentrate um, um, as much. And that was partly um, the cause, I'm, I'm repeating, not 100%, the cause of the uh, Chernobyl disaster. And this is also extremely important that at least 100,000 traffic accidents, this is in the US, are caused by, by poor sleep, meaning people um, fall asleep uh, behind the wheel or can't concentrate enough or something like that. Furthermore, there's a huge economic impact also that is estimated to be $150 billion, which is a huge amount, a year because of sleep-related fatigue. Here, um, I divided um, other um, 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 complications of poor sleep quality into four, four sections. First, we talked about road safety, and unfortunately, there are around 6,000 uh, fatal car crashes per year because of drow drowsy driving. That obviously can be caused by, by other disorders apart from poor sleep quality, but, but is predominantly caused by poor sleep quality and people fall behind, fall asleep behind the, the steering wheel, unfortunately. Also, the, regarding general health, there's it, the, one study um, um, show that there's a 48% increase, but I don't care about the percentage here. The, 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 what I want to emphasize is that poor sleep quality increases significantly the risk of heart disorders, especially, in, uh, importantly, hypertension and diabetes. And we all know that, 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 that diabetes and hypertension, people who have uh, untreated um, a diabetes or hypertension have increased risk of all sorts of other cardiovascular disorders. Also, it says here that is you're, you're three times more likely to catch a common cold. And this is more important to me, that there's a at least a third, um, a 36% 30, increase um, 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 in, uh, in the occurrence of colon, in the, in the risk of, of colon cancer in people who sleep poorly. Just a quick note, this doesn't mean that if you sleep poorly or don't sleep at all for two nights in 10 years, that, that there's a huge increase in risk. 
But people who have very demanding jobs or very, very tight schedules and who sleep four hours or five hours per night or every other night sleep extremely poorly, those are the people um, um, that have increased risks of all sorts of these disorders. Furthermore, regarding neurology and brain effects, there's an increased risk of dementias, including, unfortunately, Alzheimer's disease and all sorts of psychiatric conditions such as depression, irritability, anxiety, and others. And interestingly, um, uh, people who sleep poorly have more craving for, for food, especially and unfortunately, especially sweet, salty, and starchy food and not broccoli or something like that. That's because the levels in people who sleep poorly, the levels of the hunger hormone, as it's called, ghrelin, are increased. And ghrelin is the one that tells you, I'm hungry, you need to eat. And then, unfortunately, again, the levels of, well, of the appetite um, uh, uh, control hormone leptin are lowered. And leptin is the one that tells you you're full, you don't need to eat more. So there's this, 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 this balance here that, that promotes basically um, um, eating. And of course, because of that, um, you're more prone to obesity if you sleep less, it says here, than, than five hours. But repeating one more time, it's not one day sleeping less than five hours, it's chronic um, sleep of, of less, than, less than five hours. We can, we can basically skip this slide um, um, overall, or I can tell you the, the message in, in, in two sentences. Any sort of environmental stress, psychological stress at home, at work, or where, wherever can easily disrupt the melatonin secretion and thus disrupt sleep, causing sleep deprivation, which is horrible, or poor sleep quality, which is less worse, but still, still pretty bad. And chronic poor sleep quality is associated, we said, with all sorts of disorders that we mentioned on the previous few slides. Regarding sleep disorders, I think we've all heard of and maybe experienced insomnia, uh, meaning the trouble of either going to sleep or maintaining sleep, because you know people, people who have insomnia, they can maybe fall asleep, but then wake up after an hour or two hours and then can't fall asleep again. And that's very, very difficult, especially if it, if, if it, if it lasts months. And you can distinguish between acute insomnia and, and chronic insomnia. And unfortunately, um, the primary treatment option for insomnia is, is apart from trying to get um, personally rid of stress that's causing the insomnia is actually uh, what's called cognitive behavioral therapy, which basically um, uh, is, is when a therapist, therapist tries to help you um, uh, remove the thoughts of, of stress when, uh, just before you go to sleep. Because I think many of us probably know people who have you know, experienced extreme stress at work and sleep very, very poorly. So insomnia is extremely prevalent, um, especially acute insomnia in the world. But, but, but one, especially one disorder that, that I would like to uh, highlight here is sleep apnea. And sleep apnea, um, in one sentence is, is a disorder when, that occurs during sleep when people stop breathing altogether during sleep for brief periods of time. So it's not like they stop breathing for five hours, but they stop breathing for 10, 20, 30, 40 seconds. And it happens tens or maybe a hundred times per night. So that's, that's a very, very common uh, disorder. A third of U.S. adults are affected, and it's very, very underdiagnosed too. Why does insomnia? Why does sleep apnea even happen? We have a, an image here of of a person's um, uh, nasal cavity, and where the airflow should go um, in an ideal world uh, when people are sleeping. So, during during sleep apnea, the most common cause of, of not breathing during sleep apnea is the tongue, which we can see here, falling backwards when people are sleeping on their back and covering the airway. You can see one X here and two X and the other X here where, where it's basically covering the airway and not letting the air we breathe go to the lungs. And you can very, very, um, uh, um, a very common uh, complaint by partners who are sleeping with that person is that the person 
is trying to breathe, meaning you can see the muscle, the thorax or abdomen moving, trying to breathe, but the air is just not, not, not going in. And it usually self-correcting, meaning that after 10, 20, 30 seconds, the tongue, um, 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 because of the airway pressure, moves uh, to the side and people continue to breathe. But unfortunately, that happens again in 10 minutes or 15 minutes or five minutes. And if that um, um, phenomena occurs for months or years, it can, it can increase the risk uh, significantly of all sorts of disorders, primarily speaking about hypertension, diabetes, and then others such as cancer that we talked about, colorectal cancer specifically, and breast cancer, by the way, um, um, and other, other disorders. But why does that even happen? When people try to breathe but cannot, if you remember the part of the, of the nervous system that we talked about, which is called the sympathetic nervous system, it gets overly activated. Why? Because we need, obviously, as human beings, oxygen. And oxygen is just not go coming in and going to the cells because you're not breathing for, for brief periods of time. And that lowering of oxygen, reduction in oxygen, causes the sympathetic nervous system to get overly activated, increase heart rate and blood pressure. And when that happens 100 times per night for 10 years, that part of the sympathetic nervous system can get disrupted very easily. And then it can, it can cause diabetes and that overall can cause diabetes, hypertension, and other disorders. So the, the key culprit here is the reduction in oxygen because we're not, we're not breathing. A very um, uh, common way of treating sleep apnea, and unfortunately very few people um, uh, can completely cure sleep apnea because um, um, the, the, the tongue falling backwards um, in severe sleep apnea, meaning in sleep apnea where people stop breathing 30 or more times per hour, not per, per night, per hour, means like 40 times uh, per hour, that can, can, can severely increase the risk of all sorts of all sorts of disorders. And it cannot be easily cured because one of the reasons that the tongue falls backwards is not only because you're sleeping on your back, which is logical, but because these people for some reason have an excessively low muscle tone. And because the tongue is a muscle, the tone goes very low and it becomes kind of flaccid and then it falls backwards. And that's why it's very, very easy, it's very, very difficult to cure these types of sleep apneas. And this specific type of sleep apnea where the tongue blocks your airway is called obstructive sleep apnea versus sensual sleep apnea where signals from the brain are not even coming to your thoracic or abdominal muscles and you're not even trying to breathe. So these people, these people stop breathing altogether but don't even try breathing in central sleep apnea. But it's much, much, much rarer than, than obstructive sleep apnea. So for people who have severe apnea or moderate apnea, meaning they don't, they, they stop breathing for 15 to 30 times per, per hour of sleep, we recommend getting this device here, which is called CPAP, C-P-I-P, and it stands for continuous positive airway pressure. So it's basically the opposite of a vacuum cleaner. The vacuum cleaner sucks air in and this pumps air through this tube and this mask during sleep, so people only wear this during sleep, in their nose or mouth, depending on the, the type of the mask. And thus, it prevents the tongue from falling backwards because of the pressure of air constantly going in the nose or mouth. So it's not, it's, for some people, it's not really easy to, to uh, wear this. Why? Because if it constantly pumps air through this tube and you want to breathe out, you can't really easily breathe out because you're breathing uh, uh, through the air that's, that, that's going in. So that's why some people have difficulty um, uh, wearing this. But this, is, this, this significantly reduces the, the occurrence of apnea. And this is the golden standard for treating, not curing, but treating obstructive and um, central sleep, sleep apnea.
very quickly gonna go through through a couple of uh, uh, fun sleep stories about how I may, probably some of you know why caffeine from coffee and other caffeinated drink drinks uh, keeps you keeps many people awake, not all of them. Um, caffeine actually blocks adenosine, which is a very important sleep promoting molecule from binding to its receptor. And we've learned a few slides ago that, that adenosine binding to its receptor is one of the keys for you to fall asleep. And that's why um, uh, caffeine works for most people to keep them awake, at least you know for another 45 minutes, an hour or two hours. But uh, for some people, caffeine doesn't work because of some um, 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 genetic reasons, um, which, which can alter the adenosine receptor and then caffeine cannot easily block the, aden the adenosine from binding to its receptor. So for some people, it's actually genetics that, that, that are, are the culprit for caffeine or coffee not working. Beauty sleep, I think many, many have heard that, you know, go to sleep early, sleep well, sleep seven, eight, nine hours, and you'll look beautiful in the morning or whenever. And there was one study from Sweden out of all, all countries that showed um, that beauty sleep is actually a real thing. The experiment was, was, was set up like this. So they, have, they had um, a group of, of males, of guys, um, that didn't sleep for one and a half nights. And the other group of guys slept normally for those one or two nights. And then they had a group of females, of women, who, who, who didn't know what was going on, but they, they were just presented with pictures of these men to choose which one is, is more attractive. And surpri not surprisingly, they chose the ones that, that were actually uh, uh, not sleep deprived, meaning they slept normally. So, so beauty sleep may actually um, exist. Eye bags, probably one of the most common symptoms, if we can say, of sleep deprivation where you see, you know, those red, those, those kind of purple, gray, black um, um, uh, marks below your eyes. It actually occurs because the capillary small blood vessels dilate and then they, you can, and then because of the thin skin below your eyes, you can actually see the basically capillaries and blood uh, below the skin, which, which has that kind of purple, gray hue to it. So that's why um, uh, you have eye bags when you don't sleep poorly. We talked about parasomnias, all sorts of parasomnias. And yawning, very common question is why do I yawn? And why do I yawn when I see other people yawn? Um, such, a, such as this uh, famous person here. So there's no specific answer um, that, that's 100% true. But the most prevalent theory about yawning is that by yawning, you can decrease the intracranial, meaning the, 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 the intracranial temperature, meaning the temperature in the skull. Why? When you yawn, your, your, your heart briefly, uh, your heart frequency briefly goes up. And by it going up, they say that, that the blood from your brain can be, uh, the hot blood from your brain can be cleared up more quickly than without yawning and then colder blood can be brought to your brain and, and cool your, your um, uh, intracranial temperature. This is a theory, but it's, it's, it's relatively interesting. Um, why we, and why we yawn when, when we see other people, you can blame what are called mirror neurons in our brain. It, it, they, it, it, the same neurons are responsible for, for for uh, us crying or wanting to cry when we see other people cry or laugh when we see other people laugh. So they mirror, it's a very, very interesting uh, phenomenon. We can talk about it later um, 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 of how basically we mimic what we, what we see. And that's why when you smile at the baby, the baby will smile back usually at you, the mirror neurons. And, and finally, the final few slides um, about my research here um, on sleep deprivation. So, so I'm interested in the effect, uh, the overall effect of sleep deprivation on health and survival, um, because there are a few papers that, that show that sleep deprived animals do actually die, but the exact cause of death is unknown. You can, yeah, you can say they, they died because of sleep, because of sleep deprivation, but more specifically, we don't know why they actually, actually die.
And I'm going to show you um, uh, these few slides. So this was a paper from my lab published maybe a year ago or something like that on the humble fruit fly. You can see it here. It's very, very, very small. And imagine dissecting all these organs, such as, you know, the, the brain, the intestines and other organs from this very tiny, tiny fruit fly. So what I want to show you here um, is that we deprive fruit flies of sleep completely. So those deprived fruit flies are the green ones here. This is some just um, 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 genetics that are not really important now. So the green and the blue fruit fly are the ones deprived of sleep. And the gray fruit flies are not deprived of sleep, meaning they're just normally living their lives. And we wanted to see the levels of oxidative stress. And oxidative stress is basically a disbalance in, 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 in reactive oxygen species, which are nor which are molecules produced by the cells, which in, in normal times function as signaling molecules. So they're completely normally present in the body, but because of their potential damage, they need to be cleared out after a certain amount of time. And if they're not cleared out and accumulating, they can cause cell damage and cell death. So, and, and that, that situation where, where they're accumulating enough because of various reasons, um, it's called oxidative, oxidative stress. And interestingly, flies who don't sleep, the green and the blue one, have very high levels, meaning the, the more yellow um, uh, the, 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 the image is, the more oxidative stress there is. And you can see that in, in the intestines of the fruit flies that don't sleep, there are high levels of oxidative stress. Whereas in other organs, brain and other organs, there is basically no oxidative stress, no change in oxidative stress levels at all. The most impressive part, um, the, the most interesting part is that actually the brain, you can see here, is not the one, and it, because most people will associate sleep with the brain, but the brain is not the one that's getting damaged, it's the guts when you don't, when fruit flies don't sleep at all. And here, um, you, this is done in mice, and you can see all sorts of uh, um, uh, mouse organs, small intestine, muscle, brain, pancreas, like all sorts of um, um, uh, organs. And on non-SD means the mice are not deprived, SD is sleep deprivation. These are mice who are deprived for one day, two days, and five days. And you can track the changes in oxidative stress, meaning the more yellow, orange color, the more oxidative stress there is. The most impressive change in, in, in oxidative stress levels between non-deprived mice and mice who are deprived of sleep for only two days is the small intestine, basically just like the fly, the fruit fly. You can see in other organs, there is no change or extremely minimal change in, in oxidative stress. Yes, you can see the pancreas at basal level has more oxidative stress than the small intestine, but there is basically no change regardless of the day of sleep deprivation. In the large intestine, I would argue that you can see a change at day two and day five compared to day zero, meaning not deprived, not, uh, not deprived animals. And it, this is very interesting because it seems that from the fruit fly to mammals, that it somehow something is conserved, some pathway here is conserved that causes this oxidative stress damage. And I think the most impressive thing from all these experiments is how sleep deprivation can actually kill the flies. On the left graph, so th these are all, all of these are fly experiments because mice live much longer than flies. Flies live, our flies around 50, 55 days, more or less, or some live 40, but much less than mice who live, you know, two years, you know, two, two and a half years, depending on, on the genetic background of the mouse. And you can track uh, survival in flies much easier. On the left, you can see the gray flies, which are non-deprived. You can see them on the right too, which live a normal life, let's say 40, 35 days, 40, 35, 30 days. The dark red flies on the left, on the left here, the dark red flies are the ones that interestingly enough, I can basically first actually tell you about the, the bright red flies. So the bright red flies are the ones that are sleep deprived completely. And you can see a huge delta in survival in flies who don't sleep bright red versus flies who sleep normally gray. 
here you can see a huge delta to meaning that sleep deprivation can actually kill the fruit flies very easily. And we think through oxidative stress in the gut. Why? When you, I'm going to show you this one first. When you activate antioxidant enzymes in the brain, meaning the enzymes that should get rid of oxidative stress, but only specifically in the brain, those are the, the pale red flies they live basically the same, maybe a tiny bit longer than the flies who are totally sleep deprived. So when we deprive flies and activate antioxidant enzymes only in the brain, they live more or less the same as if we didn't activate any. But when we activate antioxidant enzymes in the gut, where there is actual oxidative stress, and we sleep deprive those flies that have cleared oxidative stress, they live more or less normally as flies who sleep normally, meaning that flies can actually survive normally without sleep, but we need to clear the oxidative stress from the gut. And this obviously can have huge implications on mammals and humans um, um, later on. And now the final basically slide here. What we want to see is how can we get rid of, of oxidative stress in mice, maybe by feeding them antioxidants, maybe by activating some specific enzyme, and regarding humans, how can we potentially, because we think this is really conserved, this oxidative stress in the gut in humans, we're going to partner with the sleep lab here at Harvard, how can we detect reactive oxygen species or elevated levels of oxidative stress in humans, but using very simple biomar uh, very, uh, using biomarkers from very simple and very easily attainable samples, such as the blood, urine, feces, that you can regularly, you know, that you regularly do at your doctor's uh, appointment almost every time. So we want to find those biomarkers and try somehow to, to tell those people, okay, because of, because of the, these biomarkers, we actually think that you might be, that your sleep quality is poor over a period of five, 10 or whatever years, and that somehow we, we need to intervene to help reduce the risk of all sorts of other disorders. So basically that's what I'm, I'm currently working on. And of course, we're gonna, we're gonna factor in the microbiome and potential inflammatory response. We think there's a subtle inflammatory response in sleep deprived animals too. But not to keep this too long. So this is a drawing from um, from one person who drew uh, members of my lab. Um, so I, it's not me. I I I don't know how to draw or sing. Um, but yeah, th these people are are great. And it was really fun working with them uh, on previous projects and on this on this project too. And thanks to them and thanks to you for for listening to me. Please, you know, any Q and A question, any questions you have put in the Q&A box and, and I can um, maybe read them to me. And if you obviously want to contact me, you can uh, contact me via, via this email address or, or any of the um, social, media, social media accounts. And if you're interested in overall science, research papers and stuff, you can, or interviews with, with um, uh, notable experts such as Nobel laureates, you can also visit our, our um, um, website, hotsciencebone.com, which is a project where we summarize all the latest biomedical research papers in an easily readable format. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alana. We have plenty of questions and all of them yeah. seem super intriguing. So I waited for you to finish um, the presentation. So the first one is, uh, how <clears throat> big of a role does music play in sleeping? Yeah, that's a very fun, uh, fun question. So music, uh, there was a, a paper I read weeks ago, like very, very recently, that people who listen to, uh, so, so one key word, uh, one, one key point to make here, um, it's not about the type of specific music that applies to everybody. It's about the type of music you listen to usually. So it's not like if I don't listen to Mozart and somebody plays me Mozart, everything's great. The, the type of music that you listen to usually can positively influence sleep, meaning people who listen to, but not obviously not loudly or anything like that, not like a party, before going to sleep, who listen to music uh, uh, which they like, they actually had um, 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 less sleep latency, meaning less time between going to bed and actually going to sleep and um, better sleep quality, which is interesting. So yeah, music can positively influence um, a sleep. Obviously not if you're having a huge loud party, but yeah. 
Thank you. Okay, so the next one, uh, rem, uh, so REM stage is not actually a part of any stages one, two, three, four, but a stage itself. Yes. Next one. Um, why is it that after I eat, I feel more sleepy? Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. That that that's an interesting one. So so the the, the explanation that uh, most people have is like. Oh, when you when you when you when you eat something, you're full, and all the blood goes in the intestines and whatever. What we actually found, and what what is under review in, in cell right now, I can tell you a, a bit more about this. That certain food, which is more uh, uh, proteinaceous, which is more um, uh, rich in protein, can influence sleep. Can actually influence the depth of sleep. Why? When you eat, and we, we prove this in mice and flies, we show this in mice and flies. So when you eat uh, food that's rich in proteins, certain peptides um, in the intestines get released. And those peptides, I mean, you probably haven't heard of it. They're called CCHA1, doesn't matter. Some peptides in the intestines get released and they go to the brain, okay, to modulate the what's called the, the dopaminergic um, um, neuronal circuitry. So in, in the fruit fly, so a certain circuitry in the brain that's responsible for sleep, and it actually increases the depth of sleep. Um, so, so we think um, the answer to that question, I can't give you a hundred percent answer, but we think that food somehow releases some sort of pe peptide that communicate to the brain through either neurons or, or um, just like through the bloodstream or something like that. So that's the best, mo I think, answer I can give you um, uh, that we have proof, so. Okay, so next one, <clears throat> I'm going to combine two very similar mm -hmm. questions into one. So it's basically about polyphasic sleep. Uh, what is your mm -hmm. opinion on it? Is it effective and healthy? Because as you said, it is not the same as sleeping in one yes. term. And the other question that is related to that is, wait, give me a second. Um, uh, can you tell us a bit more about basic or basic sleep? I personally tried five hours per night plus 1.5 hours per day um, uh -huh. because of an intensive schedule. The first seven days, I was like a zombie, but later my body adapted to it. And yeah. I had more time available. Yeah, you, 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 your, your body adapted just like uh, you, when you had jet lag the first week or so when you travel, you know, east, west, um, um, you know, huge distances, your body adapts. So that's a, that's a very important point. Your body can adapt to almost anything, almost anything. I mean, I'm not talking about some extremes. I'm talking about, you know, five hours of sleep, what, what that person said, five hours of sleep plus one hour of sleep per day. And um, um, you can also um, uh, force yourself to shift your circadian rhythm and adapt that you, that you basically force yourself, for example, to go to bed at midnight and wake at seven. It's gonna be horrible for the first few weeks, but then it's gonna to feel totally normal. And you're gonna feel sleepy around midnight. So that's why what we suggest, um, you know, to some people who have um, certain sleep disorders, try to. I think force is maybe a too too harsh of a word. Try to go to bed at a specific time and wake at a specific time for weeks and weeks, and that may actually help you. So we're, 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 I'm saying this for people who have. Um, 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 insomnia, various types of insomnias, or just cannot sleep as easily as many other, many other people. But for, 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 for polyphasic sleep, um, I know that that topic is interesting. And I know people have shown you it's good. I, I, I wouldn't feel confident to say, is it healthy or not? Or is it good or bad as, as some kind of, you know, black, white? I would say that the body is adapted to sleeping during the night in continuity. And, and so this is also important, right at, interestingly, um, kind of midday, two, three o'clock, the body is adapted to fall asleep for like an hour or so. So that's completely normal. I, I think many people actually do feel sleepy at two, three uh, two, three o'clock. So that's completely normal. But what I want to tell you, and be unfortunately, because of the very dynamic lifestyle we live in, most of us actually sleep only during the night and not during the day. So I would say that the body is adapted to sleeping during the night and not during the day, apart from very short naps. So that's what I feel confident in saying. Other, everything else will be speculation based on my personal opinion. I kind of don't want to maybe give you that. So, yeah. but a great question. Anyhow. 
Uh, what about smartwatches and their accuracy when it comes to evaluating our safety, plight, so, etc.? Yeah, so I'm in, I'm in um, um, I'm I'm um, at the beginning of a collaboration with with one um, sleep app. I'm not going to promote it, but it doesn't matter. I, I think you've probably heard of it. It's very very like millions of downloads. Um, um, because I want them to focus on sleep apnea more and not on sleep quality, because I think sleep apnea is very undiagnosed and can relatively easily be diagnosed with all those, you know, sleep apps, sleep watches and so on. I've read many papers that said that, that um, using smart watches or apps or whatever that like track sleep and, you know, quantify the percentage of deep sleep or light sleep that, that say it's not accurate. I've read also many papers that say it's really very accurate and very similar to polysomnography, which is the golden standard. From all of that, I would extrapolate that, yes, I do think that these, not, not all, I don't, I don't know for every specific app, but probably the ones that are better can <clears throat> tell you when you're sleeping or not sleeping, yes and no. I would not feel confident in the app telling me if I'm in deep or light sleep because of other factors that I think are needed based on clinical experience to actually tell you. I, I do think with, with machine learning or AI, they can get much better, but I wouldn't rely on them. That, that's what, what I would say. Um, I would just like to add something since this was actually <clears throat> mm -hmm. part of my thesis. Um, cool. So uh, apparently it depends on the smartwatch. So Garmin, mm -hmm. uh, which is a very expensive type of smartwatch has uh, types of watches that are kind of more modified towards healthcare and they're mm -hmm. super super accurate like 70 to 80 percent accuracy for uh both sleep detection and mm -hmm. oxygen saturation fitbit is next mm -hmm. in line and then google fit is about at 50 40 percent accuracy so it's sort of like cool. um they have specialized apis and everything from the technical standpoint uh, oriented towards that cool thanks <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so combining two questions again, uh, mm -hmm. what about too much sleeping and its causes on the, uh, on our brain uh, combined with yeah. another question? Wait, me to find it. There are so many. Um, I understand that sleep deprivation is not a good thing, but what about the opposite? Is it as bad as deprivation? Is it as bad as deprivation? Uh, so deprivation too much of sleeping. So uh, too much it, sleep. It's too too much sleep uh, yes. as as damaging, and how does it affect our brain? So, uh, I would not. Uh, so, I would be hesitant to say to quantify it in a way to say is it as damaging as lack of sleep? Why? Because primarily studies are done uh, in people who don't sleep enough, and not in those who sleep overly, you know, uh, overly much. There was a study that, so, so is, is a very, very binary answer to, is um, sleeping more than nine, 10 hours per day bad? The answer is yes, why? There was one study in, in, in oncology patients, so you know, patients with, with cancer, I, I'm not sure which type of cancer or what stage, I, I'm not sure of those specifics, but in that specific group, people who slept more than nine hours had worse outcomes than people who slept within the seven to nine hour period. So that gives me a bit of confidence to say, uh, a bit more of confidence to say that, that um, sleeping more than nine hours is not good for your body either. So, so that's the best answer I can, I can give you. And I wouldn't quantify it. I, I, my personal opinion, if you want it, I think less sleep, which I think, which is logical, is worse than more sleep. But I don't think more sleep is good. I think it's also bad. Awesome. Uh, so combining questions again, uh, yeah. is it true that we sleep in 90 minute cycles? And uh, I've read somewhere that we should wake up at the end of a sleep cycle. Does this make a big difference? So can you just repeat the first part? Is it true that? We sleep in 90 minute cycles. So think. Yeah, two yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I said 100 minutes is, is roughly one sleep cycle. That's totally, yeah, normal 90 to 110, that's totally fine. So the answer to that is yes. And the answer to other, the, the next question is also yes. You, in an ideal world, you should wake up at the end of the cycle, not in the middle of it, yes. Mm -hmm. And then um, I'm trying to combine questions to kind of like make sure we fit the time schedule. Mm -hmm. um, is it healthy to sleep with earphones? And then uh, the, does ASMR have positive influence on our health if we sleep with our headphones on while listening to some ASMR videos, random sounds yeah. such as rain? Yeah, so, so uh, 
this is based on just anecdotal findings. I, I, I don't, I'm, I'm sure there are papers on this, but I, I just haven't read them or haven't seen them. Um, um, anecdotally, uh, um, it is true that people who, who listen to, that for some people it works who listen you know, to white noise or um, you know, sounds of rain or something relaxing, that, that it can actually relax them more to go to sleep. I would, I would probably think that that would help um, people who are in some sort of stressful situation, something like that, more than other people. But this is just anecdotal. This is just my opinion because I just haven't, haven't seen many papers based on that topic. So the answer is anecdotally, personally, yes to that. But that's personal thing. Next up, uh, what exactly is sleep paralysis and is there any way to control it? Yeah, so, so the, the answer is no, <laughs> we can't really. Well, there, there are techniques, also anecdotal techniques that people say, you know, you should, you should go to sleep at this hour and sleep at, on this position. On this. this is all anecdotal. I don't know if that's true, but I don't think you can really control it. And sleep paralysis is absolutely um, um, true. And it happens because of, I would say, delayed exit from REM sleep, meaning you wake up, but you cannot, you're aware of your surroundings, you see everything, you know, you're in bed or wherever, but you can't move your arms, legs or whatever. And that happens because the body for, for unknown, I don't really know why, unknown reasons, it, it has that one, two minute delay from, uh, and it happens usually uh, when you're, when you're, when you're waking up out of REM, which, it, which in a sleep cycle should be the last stage, but should be um, um, the last stage. So it happens when you when you go out of REM, because in REM, as I told you, there's like total, almost total or total muscle muscle atonia, meaning your muscle completely relaxed. And for some reason, the body needs a minute or two to shift. Oh, I'm awake. Give power to the muscle so you can move. So so yeah. Next up, uh, is it true that mm -hmm. we must not wake people that are sleepwalking, and yes. why? Yes, uh, the, yeah, that's a very good one. Yes, the only, re it, it's not a neurological or whatever, it's, it's because, the recommendation is because if you wake somebody up, they might feel scared, hurt themselves in some way or something like that. So that's the only reason. Um, um, but, 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 there's a but. If, of course, the person is going towards a balcony, you should stop the person, okay? <laughs> so that's very important too. Noted. Um... Wait, I'm trying to find the ones that are less uh, broad. Um, why can some people fall asleep quickly in 10 to 20 minutes and some need longer time, sometimes an hour? In my case, maybe four. <laughs> yeah, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't know the neurological side of it. I if I were to guess, I would say that it's mostly because of day-to-day -day situations, mental or stressed or something like that. I would say it's because of that. Mm. Yeah, people with ADHD usually have a trouble falling asleep. For example. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what causes snoring during sleep? Okay, wait, I think you covered that one a bit earlier. Um, okay. Uh, 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 okay, next one. Uh, there's a theory that people do not dream uh, mobile phones nor any technology in general. Firstly, I don't remember dreaming a mobile phone, even though it's a big part of my everyday life. What do you think about that? So can you, I didn't hear the first part. It, it, people uh -huh. dream, can you repeat, please? Uh, yeah. People do not dream mobile phones nor any technology in general. Okay, interesting. I, I have, I really don't know. This is the first time I hear that. Um, I, I don't know if that's even true. I don't know. <laughs> interesting. Maybe it happens to you. I don't know. I When I come to think of it, I don't remember dreaming of, but I do remember dreaming of a laptop or like computer. I think I do, but not a mobile phone. I don't know. <laughs> um, any apps do you recommend that help with sleep, sleep, with sleep schedule? With sleep scheduling. So yeah. because I'm, I'm trying to collaborate with these people, I'm not recom I, I wouldn't recommend any because I've, I, I've used extremely little or, or none. Um, so I'm collaborating with this app that's called Sleep Cycle. I don't know if you've, you've heard of them. So they're, they're really very popular in that field because of sleep apnea. I, I'm collaborating with them. And, and so I think, I think the interface is easy. I, I started using it just to see how we can implement the sleep apnea part. 
but I really don't use um, a sleep app. So I've been using this for like a month just because of that specific reason. So I, I wouldn't, I, I, I don't know um, uh, which apps are good, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay, so another question combination. Why do we why do we dream? Uh, your opinion yeah. on lucid dreaming as well? Yeah, lucid dreaming is 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 fun, exciting. Um, some people can, um, I don't want to say force themselves, but kind of kind of force themselves into uh, dreaming lucid. There was this one cool study uh, uh, in Current Biology, so that's a very good um, um, journal. Where, where they showed that that you, that you can communicate with lucid dreamers while they are in lucid dreams, which is pretty interesting. That basically you can communicate with people who are asleep. How do they do that? So so um, um, there was this group of lucid dreamers who 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 kind of um, can force them relatively saying force themselves into lucid dream. I don't know the techniques really. Um, and then the researchers said that they needed to somehow show the researchers that they're in lucid dreaming. And, and they said, I think they need to wink their eye or something like that, something very, very small cue. And when they did that, the researchers knew, okay, they're, in, they're, in the, they're, in, um, uh, they're dreaming lucidly. And the, 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 they, the researchers asked them very simple questions to which they can only answer with simple cues, such as, you know, moving their lips or winking or something very simply. So they asked them questions, you know, such, such as what is two plus three? And they needed to wink, you know, five times, something like that. Um, uh, the Paris is the, you know, capital city of France. Yes and no. Yes or no. Yes is I don't know. two winks, one is no. So they show that that for, for many of those people, it, you can read the, the current biology paper that you can actually communicate with lucid dreamers. So I think it's a fascinating thing. Uh, I don't know why it happens, how it happens, what the What's the um, a neuroscience behind it? I really, really don't know. But dreams, some people, and I think that that could be true. People um, say that dreams occur during the transfer of, of, of memory to long-term memory, uh, which happens during sleep. So what, what you learn during the day, much of it gets transferred through the hippocampus, one of the, one of the regions in the brain, two specific regions in the brain, uh, brain cortex. So during that transfer, um, somehow it gets to your conscious, consciousness, um, those kind of memories or, or blips. And, and I think you, you, you can probably say that many of you many times dreamed of friends or events that happened during the previous day also. And that's probably, probably why. But why you dream of bizarre dreams, you know, you're flying to Mars or something like that, and you, you've never watched anything about Mars, or I, I, I don't know. Like the neuroscience, I, I don't know. it. Mm. And the final one uh, before we wrap up. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, firstly, I would like to uh, let everyone know. So uh, I will actually copy paste any of the questions that might pop up uh, past the time and forward it to the speaker. And then mm -hmm. let you know via uh, email or Slack um, what the reply was. And okay, so the wrap up question. As someone mm -hmm. who has chronic disease, I have to say that I'm pretty much now traumatized with these facts about effects of not sleeping on our intestines. Now, mm. does it mean if we have sleep deprivation, deprivation that there is a, there, that there are high chances of activating inflammation in our organism? So the, the, between yes and no, the answer, I, I'm going to explain. The answer is no. Uh, the key, why I say no, because the, the question was high chances of, of inflammation while, uh, when sleeping poorly. Why? Because in, in mammals, in mice, we've seen that there may be a subtle, I think I said mild, um, um, inflammation um, going on. Why? Because of some um, um, uh, cytokines, I mean like small inflammatory molecules um, um, that, that are elevated. So that's very preliminary stuff that I'm saying. So I wouldn't feel at all confident in, in saying yes to that question. But all the other things, um, um, Hyper, I'm always uh, highlighting hypertension and diabetes because that's so prevalent. That's, that's real and that's very, very true. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, as for the other questions, everyone will receive the uh, answers via email. And I will actually leave you with uh, the comments that were left by uh, one of the attendees. Uh, thanks a lot, Alan. I enjoyed this webinar. You presented this so simply and it was easy to follow even for someone who is not really into it. An hour well spent. Thank you very much. <laughs> An hour well spent for me too.
I am very happy we got to host you. Um, this really was a topic I was looking forward to um, both listening to and hosting uh, for a very, very long time. So, cool. Thank you very much, Anna. And thanks uh, for organizing this um, seminar webinar. <laughs> okay, awesome. Have an amazing rest cool. of your day. You too. Bye, people. Bye.